Uh, welcome everybody to those in the room and also those online. Uh, I'm Michael McCarthy, the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Science and it's a real pleasure to introduce this uh, uh, lecture for you. This is um, one of the Science at Melbourne lectures and it's that series is the premier public event series for the Faculty of Science. But tonight's lecture is even more special because it's in uh, Science Week. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathering tonight. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and also note that the land was never ceded. I also recognise that Indigenous Australians have cared for this country for tens of thousands of years and that care has been based on knowledge that's been gathered through experimentation, observation and learning over that time. So that really just makes Indigenous Australians essentially Australia's first scientists. It's a pleasure to introduce our presenter for this evening, Dr Susie Sheehy. Uh, Dr Sheehy obtained a first class honours degree in physics from the University of Melbourne and then did a Doctor of Philosophy at Oxford Physics. Her Doctor of Philosophy worked on designing a new type of uh, particle accelerator for cancer treatment and since that time her research has focused on uh, particle accelerators. Following her Doctor of Philosophy she was awarded a very prestigious Brunel Fel uh, Research Fellowship and that was based at Aztec Intense Beams Group at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. Following the fellowship, she remained within the Aztec Intense Beams Group as a senior accelerator physicist before joining Oxford Physics in 2015 on a joint appointment with Aztec to continue her research and also contribute to training and education. Uh, in 2017, she was appointed as a Royal Society University Research Fellow in Oxford Physics and is now a Senior Lecturer at the University of Melbourne and holds a visiting f uh, lectureship at the University of Oxford. Alongside her research, Dr Sheehy is passionate about the promotion and communication of science from which she has received numerous awards. And it's the evidence of um, that passion for communication of science is uh, recently, her recently published book, uh, The Matter of Everything, 12 Experiments That Changed the World. And you'll hear a little bit about the content of that book in the lecture this evening. Uh, I note that Dr Sheehy's book has been really well received with recommendations from several famous people, including rock stars. Uh, though, to be honest, I put more weight on the views of some less famous people, including my father-in-law, and I'm going to read you out his review, uh, and this hasn't actually been published, you'll be surprised to hear, so, it, you know, it's a first for you all. I found it difficult to stop reading because of the enthusiasm and clarity with which she writes. Dr John Galt, in, in his 90th year, cardiac physician, retired. So just as her research and book have been commended by many, I commend to you this presentation uh, by Dr. Susie Sheehy and invite her to present the Science at Melbourne lecture. Thank you. Thank you, thanks Mick. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming along tonight and to those of you who've joined us online as well. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. So. Um, this evening, uh, as Mick says, a lot of what I'll be talking about is based on the book I've recently um, published. And the title of my talk tonight is about discoveries that change the world, or discoveries that change our world, I should say. Um, now, there's many, many different aspects to that. And in my book, I travel through 12 key experiments in the history of physics, and in particular, particle physics, and explore the sort of unexpected ways in which they've led to uh, most of our modern technology and even societal ways of functioning. I can't tell you the entire content of a book in one talk, obviously. Um, so tonight, I'm going to pick a few examples um, and a few themes uh, that I'll run through and hopefully give you a picture of that um, 120 year adventure that we've now had um, towards understanding the fundamental nature of matter. <clears throat> um, so the story is going to start in about the year 1900 and um, 
Uh, and a lot of the action that happens is actually in around 1920. And tonight's lecture I'd like to dedicate actually to my grandmother, um, Enid Grace Sheehy, who uh, just passed away um, just two weeks ago, and it was her funeral yesterday. And she passed away at the grand old age of 101. Um, and she absolutely embodies the spirit, actually, of the people who you'll find in this lecture this evening who um, are, have a spirit of curiosity, of adventure. Um, but unfortunately, being a woman born in 1921, she left school at the age of 14, and so she was unable to pursue those passions. And um, it was to her absolute delight that my twin sister, who uh, studied as a f uh, philosopher and historian, uh, now runs uh, Yarra Rangers Museum as a director of public programs there, um, and that I'm now a physicist, and she just thinks that that is freaking awesome. <laughs> so I'm dedicating the lecture tonight to her, to her memory. Um, so let's start in about the year 1900. I don't know if you know what the life expectancy was in about 1900. Uh, it was about 46 years. <clears throat> Today, people live, uh, this is UK and Australia, rough, rough average, um, to about the age of 81, women living slightly longer than men. The Australian population back in 1900 was 3.7 million people. That's now expanded to 26.1 million. It's a much lower increase than in some other nations. Um, and one of the other big changes that's happened is around education, particularly in literacy, um, and literacy above the age of 15 years has now expanded globally from an average of only 21% of the population in around the year 1900 to about 80, uh, 86% today. <coughs> so what's happened in that period? Well, many things, as I'm sure you're aware. But one of the key things that's happened is that new inventions have led to an increase in productivity so that goods are less scarce. So growth has led to a positive sum economy. There are more people on Earth, but they are living better and longer lives than ever before. Um, this is a plot that I think most people could do with looking at occasionally when we're in the doldrums. <laughs> um, overall, actually, the progress we've made in the last 120 years has been incredible. But back in the year 1900, we didn't really predict any of this. Um, and in fact, some of the greatest minds of the time, uh, this is Lord Kelvin, who was one of the most famous theoretical physicists at the time, um, was pretty down about the idea of novel technologies and whether or not they would take off. So he says, no, neither the balloon, nor the aeroplane, nor the gliding machine will be a practical success. <laughs> um, uh, so we can be a little bit close-minded about where technology and our innovation and our creativity can take us in the future. And I think the pace of change over the last 120 years has obviously been unprecedented. Um, so I want to show you what the vision was of the year 2000 from 1900. So there was an exhibition in Paris who commissioned a series of postcards produced by artists predicting what the future would look like in the year 2000. And it's way off the mark, right? Uh, the Wright brothers had not yet made their maiden flight at this point in time, but flying was a little bit of an obsession, the ability for people to fly. But if you look closely at this, this is, um, I think it's supposed to be in London or possibly Paris. But you know, one thing that's noticeable is the buildings haven't changed, so there was no vision for architecture. The clothing hasn't changed, there's no vision for change in fashion or textiles. Um, and basically, people appear to be living more or less the same lives as they did then, other than the flying machines. But let's have a look at some other areas from other postcards. So there was uh, ideas about how information would be shared and transferred. Um, perhaps, uh, well, we didn't quite get to, get to here, did we? Oh, we can't, I can't see that, that's all right. Um, the top left one there, we didn't quite get to sort of brain downloading devices quite yet, although Elon Musk might have something to say about that. Um, how our stuff was going to be made. There was discussion about, um, or there was uh, sort of this vision almost of computers or automation technologies, but automation was thought to be mechanical in nature. There was no prediction of the electronic or electrical revolution that, that came about. Um, and one of the things that really amuses me is they seem to be really obsessed with living under the sea. Um, so, and at the same time as that, in physics, just before the turn um, in, into sort of the 1900s, in about 1894, 
again, leading physicists of the day were pretty down also about what we might find in terms of discovery in physics. They knew about things like electromagnetism, so how even how light worked and uh, electricity and magnetism. Um, they knew about uh, gravity. They knew, uh, well, sort of basically Newtonian gravity. Um, they had sort of most of the basic principles down. And so again, there's this pessimism. So Albert Mickelson says, it seems probable most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established. And I'm telling you all of this because it shows that physicists are just human too, right? And we're also limited by our capacity to imagine what might be possible. Um, now, Albert Mickelson, 10 years earlier, had disproved a long-held theory, um, the ether theory about how light travelled. Um, and so perhaps this is also hubris of saying, well, I've clearly discovered the, ma the last major principle. No one else is going to discover anything major after me. Um, so take that as a warning. And yet, since then, science has been through an enormous revolution. Um, another one, Lord Kelvin again, 1901. Uh, the future truths of physical sciences are to be looked for in a sixth place of decimals. They didn't think there was any way that physics especially could be revolutionised. And yet what came next was possibly the biggest transformation in our understanding of the universe that we will ever go through. And it came about not just through the ideas of theoretical physics. It came about through experiments, often unexpected, serendipitous experiments that weren't necessarily planned to discover what they discovered. And one of them happened here. This is in Würzburg in Germany, and I had the pleasure of going there just pre-pandemic to travel there to research for my book. And this is the lab of a physicist named Wilhelm Röntgen. Um, and now, I, I want to point out at this time, this is now 1895, 1896, there are a few things which we sort of take for granted that didn't exist and explains, to some extent, why the labs also look so different. And there were different drivers at that time, right? So the Nobel Prize in physics did not exist at this point in time. Radio did not exist, which made you know, communication, getting the news, things like that, very difficult. Um, bras did not exist, although that did not affect Willem Röntgen. Um, <laughs> Uh, no one knew the, the nature of atoms or nuclei. No one knew how the sun generated energy. Uh, we only knew about two forces, gravity, which was very, very weak, and electromagnetism, which was very, very strong. And most people thought, as, as I've shown, that, that physics or natural philosophy, as they might have called it at the time, was solved. Now, just before William Röntgen makes his discovery, which I'll tell you about, radioactivity discovered by... Uh, Becquerel about a year earlier, and Marie and Pierre Curie had discovered new types of radioactive material as well and coined the, the term radioactivity. Um, and in this lab, this man, uh, William Röntgen, discovered something completely new. Now, he was a trained physicist, and he was playing about in his lab with a device called a cathode ray tube, which looks a little bit like the device I've got in the centre of the, the desk, on the, sorry, on the end of the desk there. It's a glass tube that's evacuated. I'll show you this one in a little bit with a close-up. And he was playing around in his lab with this one day because nobody knew at the time how these devices created this sort of glow that they would see inside it. It was just kind of a novelty. People would show them off to audiences as kind of an electrical novelty item. Um, but he was playing about with them in his lab and he noticed over the side of his lab a, a screen glowing green. And he was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> now, other people might just say, oh, that's not associated with my experiment. I'm going to ignore it, you know. Um, but he actually investigated. And he spent seven weeks in his lab trying to understand as he switched on and off this tube and he covered it in things and the, the screen still kept glowing and the, the glow would go away if he switched it off, but it would come back if he switched it on. And he put in the way, he put um, books, he put wood, he put um, rubber, uh, he put it you know, through the door to the second section of his lab, which if you visit is just next door to this one. Um, and then he put metal in the way. And it was only really the heavy things like metal that seemed to stop this effect from happening. And so that gave him an idea. First he put his hand, and then he put his wife Bertha's hand um, in front of uh, what we now know uh, is an emanation coming from the tube, right? Uh, and he was able to show that these new rays, which he kind of coined the term X-rays because X was for unknown, 
um, could travel easily through um, light objects or light materials or under dense objects such as the skin, but didn't travel so easily through uh, dense objects like the bone or the ring on his wife's hand. And so uh, Röntgen discovered x-rays. Now, an interesting thing that most people don't know is he then had a choice, right? So he's seven weeks in his lab. He discovers this. He investigates it in detail. He's in a rush because about 200 other scientists around the world could accidentally discover this and scoop him to the result. And then he has a decision to make. Does he patent this idea that he's just discovered of these rays? Um, or does he actually uh, sort of hand it over to people who might be able to do something useful with it? And he chose the latter, which is important. So he, he presented, the first group that he presented his discovery to was the Würzburg Medical Society across the road from his lab. And so that's a, a picture of him presenting um, his idea. And he, he got the, uh, I think it was the head anatomist of the local community down, put his hand um, under the x-ray, took a photograph of it. And of course, the audience um, gave an enormous round of applause uh, because they immediately saw how dramatic this was going to be in the field of medicine. Suddenly you could see inside the human body without slicing it open. And it's hard to overestimate how dramatic that would have been. Um, a bit of pop culture sort of tells us a little bit of the impact that it had. People were afraid that x-rays could see into their souls. Um, there were people trying to sell uh, x-ray proof, um, uh, no, there, there were people pretending to sell x-ray opera glasses to be able to like spy on your fellow opera people. And as a result, somebody else started to sell x-ray proof underwear for women, but not for men. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so uh, my point in sort of telling you all of this is discoveries like this and, and you know, x-rays uh, really made a huge impact, even just the, using basic x-rays. Um, you'll probably be aware of using them in the dentist. Um, they used a lot in medical imaging. For a while, they were used even to image people's feet when they were being fitted for shoes, but that's not a good idea, actually. Um, nowadays, we use it for scanning baggage in the airport every time you put your bag through to see inside it. Um, inspection of goods, inspection of welds in engineering, all sorts of things we use x-rays for. Um, this photograph um, <clears throat> also shows just how quickly these new discoveries and ideas penetrate into our wider society. So this is a photograph of an iguana um, uh, from a book called Experiments in Photography by Means of X-rays. And it was taken just a few weeks after Ronkin's discovery um, by Joseph Maria Ada um, and Eduard Valenta. Uh, who were photochemists both from Austria. Um, and like, the resolution on this image compared to the one from Ronkin's hand, like the, the progress is just, just phenomenal. So things can happen very quickly, but other things that really capitalise on our discoveries can take a long, long time to come to fruition. And this is a really important point. Sometimes we can learn a piece of knowledge over here, and it takes until other things in society catch up to then coalesce together to create new imaginings, to create new innovations that go on to change the world even further. So Ronkin's initial x-rays could see bone, but they couldn't see soft tissue inside the body. They didn't have the resolution. Uh, you would have had to take many pictures from different angles, and even then, you'd really struggle. <clears throat> and one of the areas that this was a challenge for was brain scanning, so people who might have a brain lesion or brain tumour. Now, I don't know if you've had dinner, but I'll tell you quickly how this was done before the 1970s. Um, they would actually drain the cerebrospinal fluid from the brain and then strap you into a chair and then tilt you around in all different directions in three-dimensional space and take basic x-rays uh, just with the hope of being able to see like a little bump on the brain uh, to be able to image inside it. It was an absolutely horrendous procedure and I don't know how many people lived through it, to be honest with you. But then in the 1970s, Godfrey Hounsfield, um, who was working for EMI, yes, that was a record label, but it also invented various devices at the time, um, came up with this idea of using new computing technologies together with x-rays uh, to create uh, what's called a computed tomography scanner. And the first one he did was for, for brains. Um, and he, he actually recalled... Uh, he, he <laughs> He'd trek across London with like brains in bags from the abattoir to, uh, <laughs> to test them on the scanner. Um, <laughs> this is quite a like horrendous idea that he's like doing this high tech development and he's like dragging brains in, pa in paper bags, not even plastic bags, across London. Um, but his team, when they did the first scan 
um, in, in London of the first patient who had a suspected brain lesion. Uh, he recalls that they, they jumped up and down in excitement because it was only when they saw the first image reconstructing from many different angles the three-dimensional inside of somebody's brain without having to cut it open. That was the first time they realised how exciting this technology was. And then they went on to develop the full body scanner. And now CT scans, there's millions and millions of them done every day. Actually, who's, who's had a CT scan? Put your hand up if you've... Yeah, so probably half the audience. I've actually somehow never had one, but never mind. <laughs> and, and they are really used as a first line um, uh, technology in, in medicine. And so it took a long time from, it took 70, more than 70 years for the, from the discovery of x-rays to the development of that technology, which we now take for granted every day if we have a medical emergency. So at the same time that Ronkin was doing that, just one year later, there was still a question about these tubes, right? So J.J. Thompson, who was um, the physicist leading the Cavendish Lab, the preeminent uh, experimental physics lab in, in the world at the time in, in Cambridge in the UK, um, wanted to understand how the rays inside the tube were actually formed. He thought, well, Ronkin's investigated these rays that happen outside the tube, but we still don't know what's happening inside the tube. And this was one of the experiments that started to lead to the sort of downfall of this idea that we really understood nature at its most fundamental level. And I want to show you what he did. So inside this tube, the air's evacuated a little bit, and I'm just going to turn up a voltage here. And across the centre, you should be able to see if we've got the close-up camera on the screen. No, we can't display it. Well, you can see in the room, hopefully, that there's a blue line across the centre. Yep, great. So what Thompson did was he used a series, did a series of experiments using electricity to bend to bend this around um, and collecting the charge to demonstrate that this beam was carrying an electric charge. I mean, I'm calling it a beam, but actually he didn't know whether it was a form of light or a type of particle. Röntgen would have thought it was a form of light, but Thompson thought it was a type of particle. And he managed through this series of experiments to bend this beam around and collect the charge and do this whole breakdown of experiments um, like this one, so I'm just using a magnet here to bend the beam. And if I put a magnet that's the opposite polarity, it bends the opposite direction. And he would have been able to oppose the electric and the magnetic fields to actually convince himself that what this beam was composed of was not light, but it was a very, very lightweight charged particle, about 2,000 times lighter than the hydrogen atom, which was the lightest thing that they knew at the time. And so what Thompson actually managed to discover was that, that inside all of matter, there are fundamental particles smaller than atoms, um, and we now call them electrons. Uh, and the, the key thing with this is that it was the first discovery of a fundamental subatomic particle. And we still believe that the electron has no constituent parts. We still believe that it's a fundamental uh, particle. Um, now, Thompson is an interesting one just in terms of characters, in terms of who was doing these experiments. Thompson was famously useless with his hands. He did not make his own apparatus. And I'll show you in a little bit how some of this apparatus is made. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge that he had an assistant whose name was Ebenezer Everett, who made all of his apparatus um, and who only ever sort of went in the acknowledgements. He was not acknowledged as a co-author. So our, our acknowledging assistant in science has changed a little bit as well. Now, we took a little while to catch up with this idea that there was something smaller than atoms. And this, this is an idea that had been around since the ancient Greeks, right? And suddenly, Thompson's there going, no, there's something smaller than that. So he says, um, at first, there was very few who believed in the existence of these bodies smaller than atoms. And he was told afterwards by a distinguished physicist uh, that had been present uh, in Thompson's lecture, which he gave at the Royal Institution in London, that he thought he'd been <laughs> pulling their leg, right? Um, but of course, eventually, people realised oh, wait, inside all of matter are these tiny particles which transport electricity. And through the work that Thompson did, uh, and he also, two years later, explained why some of Edison's light bulbs were also able to control the flow of current. And some electrical engineers uh, picked up, including um, uh, Fleming, picked up these ideas, put them all together with the theoretical understanding that Thompson had gained from, under, from discovering the electron, and started to invent devices which would control and amplify and modulate the flow of electricity. And so what we have now is the invention of the first electronic devices. 
And I want to just differentiate between electrical and electronic for a second. So electrical devices is where there's always currents running through a wire. Electronic devices, however, have uh, beams of particles that are traveling through vacuum or through air or through, through some gas. So there's free particles traveling through. That makes them much faster, much more responsive, and gives them a lot more uh, capability. And this was the birth of the entire electronics industry. I mean, if you think radio, TV, uh, all our communications, um, all the early computers, all of that but it was based on uh, Thompson's uh, curiosity-led discovery that there was a particle um, smaller than the atom. Now, another person who we know and love in this part of the world um, is named Ernest Rutherford, and I'll get to his picture in a moment, but I'll show you one of the other devices that was commonly used um, in those days for doing experiments. Now, Ernest Rutherford was like this larger-than-life New Zealander, right, who went to the UK, went to Cambridge to study with JJ Thompson um, and revolutionised the field of radioactivity. Um, he used to speak so loudly that he would disrupt the electrical apparatus of his students and eventually they, they built a light up sign above their apparatus that said, talk softly please, it still didn't work. Um, <laughs> but he was an absolute character which makes him really easy and fun to write about but I'll come back to that in a second. And he was a big fan of simple experiments. Now you'll see Thompson and Ronkin um, but also Rutherford at first, it was sort of single experimenter in a small lab. By the time we get to Rutherford's day, it's group, small groups of researchers, sometimes working together, sometimes working solo. And I just want to show you this device because this is one of the earliest um, devices which could uh, measure electric charge. So I've got, just got, this is actually just a lighter here which has what's called a piezoelectric lighting thing. It just um, uh, generates some charge when I pull the trigger. So hopefully, those of you in the front row at least, and those of you online at home could see that when I did that, there was two leaves here, and one of them did this. Did you see that? Should I do it again? Hang on. Let's just charge it there, charge it up again. There we go. So, so when there's an electric charge on this device, this leaf uh, sits up at this, this sort of angle because it's electrically repelling from the stem because they have the same charge. And this is how simple some of the early experimental devices were um, that were used to sort of really revolutionise our understanding of the universe. Uh, and so one of the reasons why there was so much fun and easy experimentation at that time was because you could literally build this with a tin can. Um, in fact, in Rutherford's group, they often did because they had very little money. Um, and using devices like this, they could take radioactive substances and because if you put the radioactive substance near it, and because, say, alpha and beta particles types of radioactivity are electrically charged, they would slowly discharge the electroscope. And you could count how long that took. Um, and using that, you could compare all the different types of uh, radioactive materials that, that they knew. Um, and using this method, Rutherford uh, discovered many, many different things. Um, but with his first research group in Montreal in 1899, um, he was working with a chemist named Frederick Soddy. And uh, Soddy uh, argued at the time that atoms were unchanging. Um, that uh, but, but Rutherford at the time argued that, there, of course, there are objects smaller than, electron, than um, atoms called electrons, which his supervisor Thompson had discovered. Um, and there was this chemistry, physics back and forth between the two about, well, are we even talking about the same kind of matter? Now, we can look back now with the knowledge that we have on the history of physics, and this seems obvious. But it was not known. It was not known at the time, um, and one of the people who was crucial to the discoveries at that time is the person who's probably jumping out at you from that picture as hard as she did to me uh, when I first saw this image. Right, um, this striking woman in the middle. Her name is Harriet Brooks, um, and she was Rutherford's first graduate student, actually. Uh, and I'd never come across her before I researched my book. Um, and she did some incredible experimental work with Rutherford um, on the element thorium, uh, finding that uh, there was a gas emanating um, from, from thorium that sort of had a strange effect of making other objects radioactive. Uh, and so Brooks excelled in her research. She did these amazing discoveries. And then she went off to England as well to, to study with, with Thompson. And while she was gone, Rutherford and Soddy did a whole bunch more experiments and finally started to understand the concept of radioactive half-life. Um, in fact, the biggest shift in their mind was that atoms were actually changing from one type to another. And when Soddy first realised this, uh, he sort of was 
oh my goodness, Rutherford, this is transmutation. Uh, and Rutherford was like, Zoddy, don't say that or they'll have, they'll have our heads off as alchemists because it was very shameful to, to be an alchemist at this point in time, right? Um, of, of this idea that you could change lead into gold. But it turned out that nature had been doing it for free all along. Um, and the impacts of understanding radioactivity and uh, just the idea that things have a half-life is often not obvious. So I want to read to you, if I can find the right page, um, just a couple of things that we've come to understand as a result of our understanding of, uh, of radioactivity. Um, right. Uh, let me find the right bit. Um, yeah, so it's, I've just sat here. It's impossible to list all the things we know about because of radiometric dating techniques. So that is comparing the amount left of, of different elements of different half-lives, which Rutherford also came up with. Uh, but here's some things we know. So we know the Shroud of Turin is a medieval forgery, and we can put a date to the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa not once, but over multiple periods. And we know how they spread across the globe, because we can date human remains, like the 14,300-year-old ones found in a cave in Oregon. In archaeology, we can put a time scale to objects, not just locally, but compare them over different countries and even continents, letting us build a story of the prehistory of the world. We can date ice back as far as 1.5 million years old to understand the ancient climate from ice cores. And it's also thanks to radiometric dating that we know when dinosaurs roamed the Earth and the date of the asteroid, which appears to have wiped them all out 65 million years ago, uh, a theory which went out of fashion and is now big, back in fashion, apparently. Um, going further back, we can identify the first evidence of fossils that might be animals, um, a kind of early sea sponge found in 665 million year old rocks in the Trezona Formation right here in Australia. Um, and I just, I've just finished this little section by saying this knowledge forms such a rich part of the cultural and historical context of our lives and our species. And we can put all of those stories together, not just because of rock strata and comparing fossils, but because we have an accurate chronological measure from the decay of atoms that were created uh, either in the very first moments of the universe or through stars in the very, very ancient prehistory um, of our universe. Uh, and being able to discover that with something as simple as this blows my mind. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so meanwhile, however, while sci scientists were discovering all these amazing things and we were starting to learn how to use our understanding of radioactivity, well, people will always capitalise on discoveries, won't they? So radium became a hot thing before we knew about its potential to, uh, for the emanations from radium uh, to actually damage human cells. They used to put radium in boot polish, all right? In Butter, slightly worse, because it's an alpha emitter and you really shouldn't ingest those. Uh, in water. Um, lots and lots of beauty products had radium in them. And um, here's one for the men. Uh, so our knowledge, our knowledge through science and experiments doesn't always uh, get picked up and used to the best of its ability uh, by those who would like to, to make money in the world. And so there is a little bit of a difference sometimes in terms of the values that these different groups of people hold. Um, okay, let me keep going. So this device, I keep going on about it. So the electroscope was also used um, in the early 1900s to discover something which I, I hope will blow your mind if you've never heard it before and otherwise will just be a nice story. So what they observed using these um, electroscopes is that if they left them in the lab for quite a while, and I don't know if this one's done it, but the gold leaf will kind of come down. Has it, has it come down a little bit? Yeah. Um, so there's various reasons why that will happen. There's sort of ions in the air. Um, there's some radioactive decay from uh, probably from the concrete here, from the minerals in the earth from which we first discovered radioactive elements like radium and thorium. Um, and they had to factor that in to all of their calculations, right? And what they discovered was that there was slightly more radiation or that the electroscope sort of fell down slightly faster than they would have expected based on their understanding. And eventually this became such a problem that it was known sort of as the missing, the missing radiation problem or the extra radiation problem. They didn't know where this extra radiation was coming from. And so groups of scientists 
first of all took electroscopes up the Eiffel Tower, they took them down under the sea, uh, they took them into train tunnels under the earth, thinking, okay, if I'm under the earth or near the earth, all of those minerals from the earth uh, will have more radioactivity and the thing will fall down faster. But if I'm up the Eiffel Tower, I'll be further away and then it, it won't fall down as quickly. Um, unfortunately, a lot of their results showed them kind of the opposite effect. So then they thought, we need to get up higher. So a number of people started going up on hot air balloons um, and one of the key ones who eventually uh, up, got an updated version of this device called a, a Wolf Electroscope now, it's much more accurate, much more uh, suitable for going up into low pressure regions. Um, he, he saw his opportunity and this is Victor Hess now on the right hand side. He jumped in a hot air balloon, well commandeered one, got the pilot to take them up to about, I think it's about 5,000 feet from memory, um, so quite high up and observed all the way really accurately the radiation level that he, um, he observed. And he did it uh, during the day, he did it at night, um, he did it during a solar eclipse to try and figure out if the sun was the cause of this extra radiation. And what he found was that this extra radiation increased and increased the further he went up into the atmosphere. And in fact, he concluded from this that the radiation was coming from space. Um, and so this was sort of the definitive discovery of what we now call cosmic rays. Um, so that's a discovery, but of course in science, it's not enough to know that there's this radiation. What is the radiation? What's it made from? Uh, is it the type of radiation we observe on Earth, alpha, beta, you know, gamma radiation, or is it something completely different and unknown to us? And that said about another physicist who was actually a meteorologist on a completely different journey. Um, so I, I said before that I'd show you a little bit about how some of this apparatus is made. So I want to show you this. This is scientific glass blowing. Um, at the University of Melbourne up until last year, we had this amazing scientific glass blower whose name is Les Gamel. Um, he's now retired. Uh, and he kindly showed me how you would produce um, devices like the cathode ray tube or like the experiment I'm going to show you. Um, and in a lot of the books I was reading, they were describing it as um, uh, you know, the background sound of people blowing glass. And I thought, well, what does that sound like? And I'll tell you what this sounds like. It's the whoosh of gases. And as he turns up the gas to heat up the glass here, um, it makes this sort of roaring whoosh sound. And then he's blowing through a little pipe. And you'll see if you watch closely in a second that all of a sudden the glass turns from a solid to liquid. And in that moment, this sort of artisanal practice, he can create a bulb in the glass which is just about to do, forgive him a second. There we go. It's like it comes out of nowhere. It's like, it's a, such a, such a, um, such an art to it. And so in the early 1900s, unlike me who learned computer programming, You'd have to learn this if you wanted to be an experimental scientist in the early 1900s. And he's just on the lathe, pulled the two pieces of glass apart there and then just closed off the end to create a nice bulb. So, so the other sound um, that Les tells me would have been ever present, apart from the whoosh of the gases, um, was of course the sound of breaking glass. Uh, because even Les, you know, if you see his lab there, you know, he's got things everywhere, but he, you know, even he breaks things right, left and centre. First time he tried that, he broke it. Um, <laughs> so, so I do want to point out that making these discoveries, although it seems simple and it seems like anybody could walk into the lab and make a discovery, required, on, required skills that uh, we no longer even have. Um, and it, not just theoretical mathematical skills, but really practical skills as well. There's a place for artisans. In, in this kind of discovery, and there still is. But the person I want to tell you about who uh, was trying to understand this radiation, uh, his name is C.T.R. Wilson, or Charles Wilson, it's in the bottom right there. And he, his first love was meteorology, and he's from Scotland originally. Um, and he went up one day up the top of Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in Scotland, and he observed uh, these um, glories, if anyone knows what those are, and the, also the Brocken Spectre, which is like this projection of a shadow into a cloud. It's quite phenomenal if you ever, ever get to see it. And he wanted to be able to recreate some of these light effects on clouds in his lab. And so he went back to his lab and he created a device which could suddenly expand with water or with air inside it and in doing so, create a cloud. 
Um, and if you've ever opened a soft drink bottle and seen the sort of little cloud in the top, uh, that's effectively what he was looking at. And it took a number of years before someone in the lab decided to point an X-ray device at uh, Wilson's cloud chamber. And the incredible thing that they noticed was that this ability to form clouds was so dependent on tiny amounts of energy forming what's called nucleation sites in, the, in the, this cloud chamber that when you point an X-ray device at it, he could see a spray of X-rays. He could visualize invisible radiation using this device. And so he went back to the drawing board and he completely reinvented his so-called meteorological device uh, to be able to create the first type of particle detector, the first device with which we could see with our own eyes the tracks of charged particles moving through. And what people did with this was absolutely in incredible. So they would take it up mountains, they would take it to all sorts of different places, um, and then they would uh, yeah, expose it to, um, to, uh, to the cosmic rays, and then they would take many, many, many photographs of what was happening. And I'll show you here what this looks like. So I have set up a cloud chamber here. This is a more modern one, which has an alcohol vapor, which cool, falls down to a very cold plate at the bottom. And if you watch carefully, you can see these little tracks, there you go, and these little wisps and trails of cloud. Uh, now, you can come up and see the real one here, um, because it's very hard to visualize on the camera. That is a video. I, I will admit that I have cheated. There is no camera over the top here. But it is working if you would like to come and look uh, at it afterwards. Let me just replay that for a second. Oop, that's going the wrong way because it's pretty cool. And so in 1932, uh, a physicist called Anderson in the US used a device like this to discover that there was a second type of matter, uh, the opposite of normal matter, called antimatter, and he discovered the opposite of the electron, which we now call the positron. And it was so simple to discover because a lot of these particles you'll see going through here are electrons. Uh, and all he, so he, he applied a magnet like I did over there before, and the opposite charge ones bent in the opposite direction. Uh, it was that simple. To, to <laughs> uh, he had to put a lead plate down the middle to prove to himself that it wasn't coming from anywhere else. But other than that, um, and, but his version was this massive megaton thing that went up on the back of a truck to Pikes Peak in Colorado. It was a journey of a thing, of an adventure to get it up there. But effectively, the experiment itself was quite simple. So in 1932, we know that there's a new type of matter um, that had been predicted three years earlier, but Anderson didn't know that. Um, and he discovered antimatter. And we still don't know today why our universe is made of mostly matter and not antimatter. It's still one of the questions that we're trying to answer. Um, but we do use antimatter in positron emission tomography scanners in, um, uh, in uh, the medical domain. Uh, in 1936, uh, a very similar experiment discovered a heavy type of electron called a muon. And this was completely unexpected. No one predicted this at all. Um, and it, it revolutionized our understanding of particle physics. And we now understand there's many different types of particles, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and you wouldn't think that there's any use for a sort of heavy type of electron that comes out of the sky and travels through meters and meters of rock. But it turns out that if you wait long enough after 1932, uh, by about the 60s, people were thinking, aha, we can use a more modern type of detector and we can wait for these cosmic ray muons to come from the atmosphere and go through large objects like the pyramids that you wouldn't have a hope of putting an X-ray through. And you can scan them using these detectors. And so that's how they discovered that inside um, Khufu's Great Pyramid in Egypt, there is a hidden chamber that was not known about before. Um, they've also set up uh, these uh, sort of muon detectors um, in fields outside volcanoes in various countries so that now you can actually watch the real-time movement of magma and the development of eruptions in volcanoes using particles from space, which is pretty cool. Um, and they're even developing commercial methods to be able to use muons to actually scan very large objects that, again, X-rays couldn't get through. So if you wait long enough, <laughs> some of these discoveries lead to absolutely incredible technologies. Now, one thing I discovered in writing my book um, was, like Harriet Brooks before, that there were always, in this field, 
a number of women making incredible discoveries. And one of the heartening things about writing this book was discovering their stories. And so very quickly, I'll tell you two of them. Marietta Blau was an Austrian physicist. And instead of working with a cloud chamber, she invented a new photographic method of uh, tracking charged particles, which was much more robust. You, know, you didn't have to worry about this sort of expanding device or powering anything. You could just get a bunch of photographic emulsion, which she uh, specially developed with Kodak and Ilford at the time. And you could put it in a big stack and you could send it up a mountain and leave it there for months and then bring it back down and process the footage, uh, which sounds easy. Um, and then I discovered in Bristol recently it is not as easy as, as I had in my head. So it was quite a specialised art. But she developed that ability. Um, and she uh, discovered with one of her also female collaborators in Austria um, the first pictures of what's happening here, which is they called a star of disintegration. It's a high energy cosmic ray coming from space, hitting a heavy atom inside the emulsion and exploding into a whole lot of uh, other uh, particles, uh, which is super cool. Um, now, Marietta Blau was nominated for the Nobel Prize many, many times uh, and never got it um, because there were some rather biased reviews of her work written by some of the people who assessed the, uh, assessed the case. Um, it's a whole story. <laughs> I'll leave you to look it up. Some of it's in the book. Um, uh, but her work was sort of overlooked and not recognised. Somebody's work who also was massively overlooked and was only sort of rediscovered in about the 1980s was an Indian female physicist named Biba Chowdhury. And her discovery is even more remarkable. She used Blau's method to discover a new type of particle again. So I talked about the muon. She discovered that there was two particles around the same mass, uh, and the other one was called the pion, um, which became a very, very important discovery for which Cecil Powell in Bristol was awarded the Nobel Prize in about 1950. Uh, he acknowledged her precedent, which, by the way, wasn't obscure. It was a first authored nature paper. That's as big as it gets in physics. Um, but her contribution was overlooked in the citations taken to award uh, Powell the Nobel Prize in 1950. Um, and I, I'm sort of telling you all this uh, because, first of all, it's important to me to recognise that there were women in the field, and it's important to all of us, but also that this is not a few obscure cases. Um, there is a, a sort of effect uh, which now has a name. It's called the Matilda effect, uh, which is this effect of overlooking the contributions of women, especially in innovation and science, throughout history. And it was coined by uh, Margaret Rossiter after Matilda Gage, who was a, a suffragist who first noted that we often attribute the contributions of women to either the men they worked with or we just reduce uh, how important those contributions seem. And she, Margaret Rossiter, in her work naming this, encouraged all of us to go out there and to rewrite into history the stories of these women. Um, and so that is exactly what I did in the book. And I'm going to do it a little bit more tonight as well, because I want to introduce you to one physicist you may never have heard of, uh, who's a local character, um, and that's Jean Leiby. In our physics department here, we have a lecture theatre called the Leiby Theatre. Sadly, it's not named after her. It's named after her father, um, who was also working here. But Jean Leiby was actually the first female physics PhD at the University of Melbourne. And the reason why this is a lovely story to tell, along with Blau and Chowdhury, is because she sort of followed, as it were, their line of research. And she worked on cosmic rays. She used some of their technology, the photographic emulsions. Um, and she made enormous contributions to yeah, the cosmic rays, meteorology. Um, and she later used other techniques like radar as well, uh, and also did one of the first uh, climatic impact assessments measuring atmospheric aerosols, ozone, water vapour, and so forth. So she was an absolute pioneer um, in the physics of the atmosphere. And probably had she uh, kept working in the field, she would have contributed also to, to the field of climate change. So she became a lecturer in physics at Melbourne Uni and senior lecturer at the RAAF, so Jean Leiby. All right, so just to summarise where we're at, because I can't get through everything in the book. <laughs> Uh, in just over 20 years, right, there's this enormous revolution in physics. We know that the atom isn't the smallest object. We know that some atoms aren't stable over time. Uh, and this means that change is an inherent part of nature, which uh, psychologically and philosophically uh, we hadn't realised before, happens right down at the level of the fundamental constituents of the universe, which is quite uh, an incredible thing. 
Um, we also found out, again, through Ernest, some of Ernest Rutherford's research um, and his uh, students and staff, that the atom is a nucleus, a small, dense nucleus. And so we discovered that the atom itself was mostly empty space. We later discovered that light acted like a particle and a wave, and in fact, all of matter acts both like particles and waves, and the foundations of quantum mechanics started to come out of this work. Um, we discovered that we're living in a violent shower of high-energy particles coming from space. <laughs> and we also learned that the universe is far richer and more complex than we thought. Now, what kicked off after this period was a race to understand the fundamental constituents of nature. And to do that required the technology that I've spent my career working on, which is a particle accelerator. So that is a device which could produce a copious supply of atoms and electrons with energies far transcending what would come from natural radioactive elements. And this was a speech Ernest Rutherford made as the president of the Royal Society in London. This was the preeminent question in physics in 1927. And boy, did he get an answer to that. So there were so many different options. So people were using high voltages like Tesla coils to try and give energy to these particles. Um, the first successful one was actually in Cambridge uh, in his own lab, which was uh, Cockcroft and Walton. I tell the story in the book of their first working particle accelerator that split the atom. Uh, and over in uh, Berkeley, California, Ernest Lawrence, uh, another very adventurous physicist comes up with a circular accelerator called the cyclotron. And this field just grew and grew as our understanding grew and grew until we get to the beginnings of what I would call big science, where suddenly we have lots of specialist people, engineers, chemists, physicists, um, and so on, all working together to create these enormous laboratories. It's no longer a small team in a small lab. People are having to work together uh, in order to delve further into their understanding of matter. And of course, what comes after that uh, in uh, the 1940s um, is the use of our understanding of nuclear physics for a very dramatic uh, reason in World War II. And I will point out that a lot of the physicists I've talked about and that feature in the stories in my book were part of the Manhattan Project um, to develop nuclear weapons in World War II. They were called upon, like everyone was called upon, to use their skills for what they thought was uh, an enormous threat to the values of their country, and they did so. They didn't know it was possible, and some scientists actually decided to abstain. So Lisa Meitner, who coined the term fission, uh, early pioneer in nuclear physics, despite having every reason, having been, um, you know, uh, ostracised from Austria because of her Jewish heritage, she, uh, you know, she very much took the pacifist view um, and she said, I will have nothing to do with the bomb it, when she was invited. Now, it was not the physicist's decision to use the bomb. In fact, there were campaigns against that. Um, but obviously, the use of knowledge, the use of our discovery um, is something that we need to think very, very deeply about. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Hiroshima. I collaborate with a the group there. Um, and this, this is their city when that uh, first bomb was dropped. And this changed the landscape of physics entirely. I mean, it changed the landscape of the world, obviously. But of course, it changed the way we do physics. Um, and so even Winston Churchill was looking to the US at this point in time and saying, you know, let them act up to the level of their responsibilities, not for themselves, but for others. And then a brighter day may dawn upon human history. And it was after World War II and the example of all these physicists working together to do something that we didn't know was possible that people decided to harness that ability and work on it and develop it um, for peace. And this didn't just happen in the US. In Europe, countries that had previously been at war banded together to form the biggest, now biggest particle physics lab in the world, CERN, um, founded in 1954 with nine founding countries who, who as I said, had, had been at war. And it is their remit of science for peace. They are not allowed to do anything in the region of defense or even commercialization. Even the gift shop isn't allowed to turn a profit. <laughs> uh, so by the 1960s, we had all these now big particle accelerators. We know the atom has a nucleus. Uh, these big science labs bring new opportunities. 
we can create things like radioisotopes to do diagnosis in medicine. Uh, and we have these machines, these particle accelerators, that can create lots of new particles. Um, and eventually, it got to the point where there were 208 different so-called fundamental particles. And this was where experiment got a bit out of control. And the theorists had to then work with the experimentalists to make sense of all this wild exper experimental data uh, and pull together what we, what we now know. Um, so in the 1960s, we knew there was a, a nuclear force holding together the nucleus of the atom, um, but they didn't know that there was more than one nuclear force at the time and wanted to understand how that all worked. Um, and so it was after World War II that the big accelerators started to be used for discovery. Um, but there's a lot of other things that big science labs did as, as well. Um, and some of the major ones came when you had people like medical doctors starting to work on the same big laboratories and in the same institutes as all the physicists and engineers. And then suddenly all these ideas could come together and uh, create uh, really world-changing technologies. Um, and a, a few years ago, uh, Margaret Heffernan, who's a, a wonderful speaker, I don't know her, um, decided to look at the ways that people collaborate together and um, came up with a few fundamental principles. So the good collaborations are ones that have dialogue with people with different mental models and ways of knowing, so that interdisciplinary way of working, um, that they avoid clustering around people who agree with us in problem solving. And if you think of, I don't know, like a platform like Twitter and the way that like eventually you block everyone unless they agree with you, uh, you know, and the way our media works, so it's an interesting... Um, <laughs> It's an interesting thing to reflect on, isn't it? Um, good collaborations seek out people who have different backgrounds and disciplinary expertise and engage with diverse team members in collaborative problem solving. Um, and so this is a really interesting one that th these big collaborations and these big labs are no longer just big groups of physicists, right? They have very different specialisms all working together. Um, now there's another study I want to tell you about, about people working in groups to solve hard problems. Um, and it's a study that uh, was conducted at MIT, and they put people into groups and they asked them to solve really difficult problems, including maths problems. And they were trying to understand what makes groups successful at difficult technical problems. Counter to perhaps our expectation, the factors to the successful groups was not IQ or average IQ. So the peak IQ in the group did not matter, um, and the average IQ of the group did not matter. What mattered was a high degree of emotional intelligence and social sensitivity, so the ability to you know, sort of work with others in a socially sensitive way, and groups that gave equal time to all group members so people could contribute. And there's a third one, which is slightly controversial, which correlates with number one, more women in the group. And I don't mean more women up to an even number. I mean overall up to 100%. Interesting. Interesting finding. Um, it does obviously correlate with number one. Uh, and so it's an interesting move that we're seeing in some areas of collaboration in business and industry um, around uh, there's been enormous shifts towards uh, more emotionally sensitive and ethically driven uh, ways of working. And I think it's a really interesting one given studies like this. And when you do things like this, people come up with and are enabled to come up with really creative solutions. This is Tim Berners-Lee. And when he was working at CERN in the 1990s, he realised that they were going to have a huge problem with the amount of data coming through and being able to share that worldwide with their many different collaborators. And he invented a little thing called the World Wide Web, um, which CERN then put out uh, basically free of charge into the world. Uh, and the result is what we now call, what we now usually refer to as, as the web or the internet, right? So the physical hardware structure existed before, but he came up with all the protocols which we would now refer to um, as the web. There are other things that came out as well. From radar developments came new technologies which could develop more compact particle accelerators, which are now used in about 50% of cancer treatments all around the world. And the explosion of these technologies and these ideas um, is very much not confined to physics. Now you will find particle accelerators in all walks of life and, of course, lots of other technologies that are not mine, but I work on the accelerators, so I'll tell you about it. So everything from making the chips inside your smartphones to making shrink wrap to making stronger tires to treating cancer to discovering the secrets of the universe. These inventions have absolutely transformed our society. 
Um, and one of them, for example, that you couldn't have predicted, if I can go back one second, um, was that the, the first really large particle collider called the Tevatron, which was the predecessor to the Large Hadron Collider in many ways, decided to use um, superconducting magnets, very novel technology at the time. They ordered and purchased and, and worked with uh, the entire world's supply of superconducting material at that time. And uh, what that created was a market for superconducting wire that led to very, very strong magnets that are now used in MRI scanners. It enabled the entire MRI industry uh, in levitating trains and potentially in future fusion reactors. And the largest manufacturer of that wire worldwide absolutely attributes that every program in superconductivity there is today owes itself to the fact that Fermilab, these experimental, you know, curiosity-driven research about particle physics, built this enormous machine, this enormous experiment, and it worked. And so over many years, and in about the 1970s, we sort of brought together this model called the standard model of particle physics. And that really is, I, I don't want to denigrate theoretical physicists here. I'm an experimentalist, so I get excited about experiments. But this is the pinnacle of theoretical achievement in, in that period, bringing together all of our understanding uh, of the theory to understand that there are only actually a handful of fundamental particles that make up all the matter that we know. And in fact, making up everything that you and I are made of is actually just two quarks, the up and down quarks on the top left there, but there are actually two other families, charm strange, top and bottom, discovered over successive generations of, of big colliders. And then uh, these other particles called electrons, that, it's called leptons, sorry. There's the electron, uh, which we know and love, that makes up us. Uh, I've mentioned the muon, there's a heavier one called the tau, and there's some ghostly particles called neutrinos, which are critical to the whole model, but again, they're covered in the book. What was missing for a long time, for about 70 years, was the piece of the puzzle that appeared to give everything else mass in the equations, and that was called the Higgs boson. Uh, it was searched for first at the Tevatron until they sadly had to shut it down in 2011. This is Helen Edwards, accelerator physicist there, who was in charge of that. And then we had the birth over about a 25-year period of the biggest lab, the most complex experiment that we have ever built, and that's the Large Hadron Collider. People normally show that picture, but that's the actual collider. That's, that's the accelerator itself. 27 kilometer long behemoth under Switzerland and France. Um, and uh, it's searching for many things, but the key thing it wanted to find to start with was the Higgs boson which it successfully did, the teams of thousands of researchers working together um, in 2012. And this was the moment when it was announced at CERN, simultaneously announced in Melbourne, where the major conference was that year. Um, and that was basically the pinnacle of what we understood in particle physics at that time. Now, there's many more things we're going to explore in particle physics. All of the matter and all the things I just showed you we now know only make up about 4% of the mass energy of the universe. This is an area of discovery that is going to continue, and my colleagues in particle physics here are doing wonderful things in building dark matter detectors, and I implore you to go and look out for talks about that. But I just quickly want to show you um, what's happening in, in my lab here, in my group here. Uh, as you'll probably have noticed, I get quite excited about the practical applications of the technologies that we've developed for next generation particle physics. And so we have a collaboration with CERN now um, where we're actually installing in our lab in the basement in Melbourne Physics, uh, one of the most compact particle accelerator systems in the world that was developed for the next generation of collider. And we literally have uh, $6 million worth of equipment that CERN have shipped out to us. So we are a little offshoot of CERN. Um, and we're going to be using this little particle accelerator to develop new medical technologies, which is what my, my group is focused on. So that's really exciting. And I feel like you know, I've just scratched the surface of what's possible, of what imaginings might be possible with the knowledge we have and what innovations might be possible. Um, so I just want to close by saying we all recognise that there are so many problems facing us today. It feels like we're at this juncture in history where, uh-oh, if we really don't get our act together now, that's it, humanity, you know, we're gone. Uh, but even pre-pandemic and even pre where we're at now, in about 2015, there was a survey done uh, that asked people if they think the world is getting better. And nine in 10 people did not think the world is getting better, even before COVID, right? <laughs> 
And so I want to I want to sort of hark back to my initial slides of that enormous growth and that enormous um, period of change that has come about from. Uh, really this interplay between how our society evolves and how what we get curious about and what we experiment on has the capacity to actually create new things which can completely uh, change the world. And when I looked back over 120 years of this, I came up with three different sort of things that we should focus on uh, and, and the traits that became sort of the common traits among the people who I'd written about. The first was their ability to ask good questions, good open questions, sometimes big questions, sometimes small, but always a, a good question. So when Thompson was investigating the electron, he, he didn't ask, you know, he didn't sort of say, uh, you know, does this, uh, does this exist or not? He sort of said, what is the nature of these rays? And he was open-minded about the outcome of, of that question. The second thing is a culture of curiosity. Now, I could just say curiosity, I'm always going on about it, but here I want to emphasize a culture of curiosity, actually allowing people the freedom and space to uh, actually follow their nose into what they're interested in. So often we have deadlines, we have stakeholders, we have KPIs, we have all these things that we all love to hate. Um, and where is the space in that for people to sit there and go, what's that glowing screen over the side of my lab? Okay, our discovery is now gonna look a little bit different but if we don't keep an open mind about what is possible in nature, we are going to miss those things. Um, and the final one I'd like to say uh, is the freedom to persist. And I think at this point in time in uh, our research environment and our research culture, uh, this is one that I would really like to drive home, especially to our political leaders, which is that freedom to persist includes money. I know that's a dirty word. <laughs> But Australia has one of the lowest funded uh, per capita of GDP uh, science funding uh, in the G20. Um, we are an extremely rich nation and we are well behind our peers in terms of how much money we put into research. And there is an enormous push towards very directed uh, applied research rather than the curiosity driven stuff. Um, there has to be a place for both of those and there has to be uh, you know, a strong resonance between them. You can't just focus on something that's going to make money in five years. As I've shown, most of these things take 70 years, 100 years to come to fruition. And if you don't cultivate the people and the expertise who are going to do that work, you can forget about the major innovation coming from this country. Uh, sorry to be down about that. <laughs> So uh, just to finish with, I really, yeah, I want to thank you all again for coming along tonight. Um, there's many, many more stories here about the kinds of people and the kinds of work that we do. Um, and I also just want to absolutely thank the University of Melbourne for absolutely uh, cultivating those, uh, those three things um, and for allowing uh, my group to do the best work that they can do. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, mate. Uh, thank you, Susie. We're going to have a little bit of a conversation now, so we're going to invite questions from the audience. Uh, so we'll just take our seat. So just put up your hands within the audience, and we've got roving mics that we can bring around. And we also have questions online as well. So we might start off with an online question. This can was a question by K Carl Joseph. Joseph. Uh, they asked, where are the artisans in today's science and do you see elements of craft practice in your own work? 100%, brilliant question. Um, I mean, you, you probably see this as well, but I can directly answer that in, in my field because this um, new lab we have with this very compact accelerator technology takes extremely precise manufacturing and milling. In fact, uh, when I came to Australia, I was like, oh, I'm not sure actually we can do this in, in this country because there's only about four places that, that can machine copper to the precision of one micrometer. Um, and so what's happened uh, in the last two years is we've, is we've collaborated with, with CERN um, to actually skill up uh, a company called the Australian National Fabrication Facility who've invested a whole lot of uh, money in what's called a nano milling device. Uh, so we're now producing, or they are now producing, the most precise components ever produced in Australia. Um, and that is, 
I mean, when I hear about them working, like if you walk in the room while this thing is milling, it will vary the temperature so much in the room that you'll lose your precision. It's that hard. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a biologist and I've got a similar scenario where, you know, the artisan is helping us. So we've, we're looking at detectability of invasive plants and it's very hard to put those plants out into the environment to see how well we can detect them because there's a good chance we'll miss them mm. in future. So we got, a, we got someone to create plants for us. So fake plants, they're not, they're not real plants. And these are so realistic that I handed one to a student and they smelt the flower. Wow. Because, I mean, it <clears throat> that didn't smell of anything, of course, because it was fake. It's just plastic and metal. So, yeah. yeah that's, uh, and it's those skills, you can't replace them, right? Like, if you, if you lose that skill, someone's got to kind of learn it, learn it all over again from scratch. It's hard to, hard to build it again if you lose it. I've got a question for you about art and science communication. Mm. Do, do you see art being used for science communication? Um, 100%. I mean, case in point, the, the science gallery here. Yeah, I think uh, what I love about art and science communication, and I should say my lead, uh, the lead physicist on this uh, project, he's not just a physicist, he's also an artist, um, which is really cool. So, And we have a number of artists who are already working with, with our lab. And I think what's amazing about artists and about a lot of writers as well is that they they find new ways of expressing things. They, they find ways to express emotion that maybe in our, you know, like more scientific rigorous viewpoint we miss because they're sort of, you know, we're here on the knuckle down the detail of what we can describe. And, and, and you know, art allows us to go on this emotional journey. Um, and often it's artists or creatives who will predict the potential impact or use of what it is that we as scientists or engineers are are inventing um, and I see a, a huge role in people working together in that way and um, yeah I, I think also just the skills that people have in cultivating creativity in the arts is something that we are missing out on in the sciences yeah I, I went through a number of uh, sort of really interesting writing sort of creativity processes when I, I wrote this book and and yeah that's what I learned is uh, often we think about art science collaboration as artists taking inspiration from scientists but oh my goodness, we are missing a trick in the other direction with helping us think more creatively. Yep. And you'll be at the Melbourne Writers' Festival before too much I will longer. Be, yeah, well. I've got, yeah, um, with Toby Walsh on um, technology and AI, um, and then also a panel on um, Ukraine, actually, and about how uh, the war in Ukraine is affecting uh, big international science projects. Yep. Terrific. Have we got a question? Just wait for the microphone so people online can hear us. Um, you mentioned about the particle accelerator will be installed. Um, what um, benefits for the medicine do you expect or hope it will bring? Thank Can you, you just for repeat asking. the question? I yeah, don't know sure. If people... so, uh, so the question was just asking about um, the particle accelerator that I'm installing, and the yes. question was what benefits um, I think for medicine? you said it will be installed to um, help medicine or improve. Yes. Uh, yeah, what exactly do you expect? Is it like a new scanning technique, so new machinery, or what exactly do you hope to achieve? Yeah, thank you for allowing yeah. me to expand on it because I didn't have time in the talk. Um, so, so there's a new, uh, so, so there's two key ways that we treat cancer at the moment. One is using, um, using radiation, I should say. Uh, the mainstay is using x-rays, high energy x-rays that travel all the way through the body and out the other side. Uh, that's your typical radiotherapy, which is, treats about half of all cancer patients. A much more precise form of that is called particle therapy or proton therapy, which requires a much bigger machine, but has a much more precise energy deposition. Uh, and they're currently constructing the first proton therapy therapy facility in Australia in Adelaide. It's called the Bragg Centre. Um, so that will have some benefits for especially like paediatric cases and um, hard to reach tumours and things like this. Uh, it's now quite a widespread um, treatment around the world, but this, is, this will be the first time we've had it in Australia. Um, but all the time we're, we're starting to understand the interactions of different beams at different energies uh, in the human body and the radiobiology, radiobiology of that. And so one of the hopes with the machines that, that we're looking at and building is to actually use electrons, but at a much higher energy than has been used before, uh, which could find uh, their application as, uh, basically they're sort of as good as particle therapy, um, but we could make them with this, 
very compact accelerator technology, small enough to fit in a regular sort of hospital treatment room. Um, the other advantage of it is that you could deliver the dose very, very rapidly in a um, type of dose delivery called FLASH, which is a massive hot topic in the field at the moment, where that could enable us to treat cancer instead of having 25 sessions where people come back uh, day after day, five weeks in a row. The potential is it could enable us to be able to treat cancer in one or two sessions. Um, and, but at the moment, being able to do that requires a, a particle accelerator about 30 metres long, which isn't very viable in most treatment rooms. Um, so this technology, because it's much more compact, um, could, <laughs> could lead us to being able to do that in a compact footprint, making it more, you know, actually um, financially accessible. Um, and that's just sort of one of the, one of the projects that we're working toward with, with that lab. There's many, many others. <laughs> Oh, we've got a couple here. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was fascinated by um, your forward-looking view in terms of um, getting support for curiosity-based science and physics in particular and the difficulty that we have faced in Australia for a long time mm. in that and I'm wondering if part of the answer is sort of what you've been talking about in the sense of not actually thinking, oh, we'll do this stuff and in, you know, in 70 or 80 years or some long time we might get some benefit, but to try and integrate the approach of getting some near-term benefit, mm. be it a medical application or be it linking to art or, or something like that. How do you think we can convince... Uh, governments in particular that you, you raised that, oh, okay, look, it's going to be a long time, so let's let the rest of the world fund it and we'll just benefit from it, you know, when it's useful. Yeah, so, so that, that last statement's important, that, that concept of, oh, well, you know, this is going to be expensive to invest in this research and it might not pay off, so we'll let everybody else do that and then we'll capitalise on it at, at the end of the day. Um, that appears to have been the, the approach in this country for quite a few years. Um, in some areas. Uh, it appears to me that it, it doesn't work because uh, we always appear to be left behind. <laughs> and when you don't have the knowledge, you know, that's, you're, you'll never catch up. Um, so I, I think there is a place for, I don't want to uh, denigrate applied research. I basically am working in applied research. Um, that's one of the fun things about my job is I work between curiosity driven and applied. So I can work on next generation colliders or I can work on a, you know, potentially commercial cancer treatment device. Um, I do see a place for mission-led uh, research, mission-led challenges, uh, as well as that more open-ended, curiosity-driven research. Um, I, I think there's a big focus at the moment on uh, more on the mission-led or the sort of, you know, top-down, here are our priorities-based research funding calls. I think what those do is they silo uh, our funding, or you know, they sort of force everyone into these, oh, these are the most important things. So, for example, advanced manufacturing is one of them. Health is one of them at the moment, but you'd be surprised to hear that if you're not right at the clinical trial end, no, nah, you got, you don't, no. Nah. Technology development, no. Nah. Um, and I think by doing these top-down ones all the time, we miss the exciting things that are in the gaps. Um, and people are trying to shoehorn their research into to different areas. And I think the other thing um, that is possibly even more important than the specific calls that we put out is the longevity of funding. Um, we, in this country, seem to have very sort of short-term calls, which ca causes a lot of instability, especially for our younger researchers. Um, and because there are fewer research jobs here, uh, it, it, that instability and that brain drain which happens when people just go, well, if I go to Europe, at least some, you know, there's a few options available to me. Um, whereas if this grant dries up, uh, and there's a 10% success rate of my PI getting the next one, um, my whole career is at stake. You know, I've studied 10 years and my career is... So, so people leave. I understand. I mean, I left, right? <laughs> um, and I think that longevity of funding and that stability, especially in a geographically isolated country, um, is something we really need to look at uh, quite seriously. Yeah. Because we're not going to use those great ideas because all the people who can use them are going to be overseas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, if you don't fund it well enough, it's not a, it's not a, um, 
exciting enough place to be and you don't feel no. like you can make a difference in the world if you think, oh, I'm always going to be scrabbling for research funding. So do you know what? I'm just going to go and work for Google instead and they'll pay me twice as much and I'll have job security and I'll, I'll use my brain mostly. Uh, but okay, I'm not going to kill cancer. I'm not going to, you know. Uh, these are the real decisions people make in, in their lives about what to do with their skill set. And these are the, the highest trained, some of the smartest people we have, and I, I think you know we're doing them a disservice at the moment. Um, and and yeah, it's it's very challenging. <laughs> We've got a question over here. Thanks for your presentation. It was um, really interesting and inspiring. Um, I'm. We've seen the politicisation of uh, science through the climate wars. Um, how do we rebuild the standing of scientists, science and scientists in the public discourse? Um, and was that part of the motivation for the book? So it's interesting. Um, obviously, I was uh, working in the UK when I decided to write the book. Um, and there's a, you hear people say, you know, oh, you know, the standing of science and scientists and this sort of anti-expert rhetoric. But actually, there's been studies done that sort of went out and, and did a reasonable job of surveying the public about their views uh, of their respect for and understanding of science and scientists. And it's almost, it's almost overwhelmingly positive. Um, actually, very few uh, people would have us do away with science. Um, and I don't know, maybe those few people end up in power, but... <laughs> Sorry, maybe shouldn't have said that when the camera's rolling. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, COVID was a really interesting time for that because, it, you know, we went through these sort of waves of uh, either, you know, massive respect for and um, uh, almost like, oh, these are the only people that know what's happening, listen to the science... And then the science or the scientists themselves or their words being used yet yeah, for political means. Um, and I, I think really it's up to us as a society to hold people to account when they do that. Um, you know, it, it, scientists aren't always people who are going to be able to stand up there and sort of argue the case back again, uh, not when they're in the lab doing the good science every day. So actually I would say that it's really important that our society is scientifically literate enough to be able to call out people when they're misusing statistics, when they're misusing science, or when they're sort of using it as if it's a panacea rather than a, 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 a work in progress, right? Um, I, I don't know. That a lot of people sort of grow up seeing science as a set of facts, and it's, it's not. It's a, it's a process, and it's a self-correcting process, which is what makes it so powerful. So the person in the front here just said a lot of experiments that people are talking about can, cannot be replicated. That's a whole other thing about the repl some areas of replication crisis in science, which is often driven by, uh, by the desire for research funding, that people need those top publications to get research funding. Oh, so many layers of complication. We've had some nice replication of some famous experiments though tonight, so that's good. It's, hard, it's pretty hard to get them to work. <laughs> <laughs> We've got questions. One more over here. Yeah. You've highlighted the uh, 12 experiments that changed the world. Would you like to speculate on what will be the 13th and 14th? <laughs> From the biological point of view, would the regeneration of a thylacine be up there or not? Oh, that's newsworthy, isn't it? You should probably ask him that. Um, so I should, so I should preface that by saying, uh, in any book about experiments that change the world, I have to choose experiments, right? There are thousands of experiments, tens of thousands of experiments I could have chosen to, to go in the book. This is my selection of 12, which I think changed the world. Um, and I'm sure every other scientist, every other physicist, even every other particle physicist would have chosen, uh, chosen different ones. So this is sort of my, my journey through them. Um, there were a few which I was kind of gutted to leave out. Um, uh, it was a pity that I couldn't fit more about Marie Curie's uh, early experiments, for example, because that's a, a really lovely story, but it's also one that's well-known. Um, so, yeah, I... Th look, there are so many experiments happening at the moment, even in particle physics, that uh, it's sort of hard to put your finger on one and sort of say, I think this one's where something's going to happen. Um, uh, the thylacine question's a really interesting one. I mean, there's two sides to the argument for me. There's an inspiration value in some of these big projects and some of these um, sort of newsworthy projects that focuses people's attention on things like conservation. Uh, however, the counter argument to that is 
we should probably save the species which are critically endangered now before bringing back one uh, uh, that that has has gone out. But the thing you're all nodding along with that and saying yes uh, is because that's been in the news this week, right? So sometimes all publicity is good publicity uh, for science as a, as a whole and for conservation as a whole and for the techniques that people are developing. So it's, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not sure we should go through with bringing the thylacine back, but it sure created an interesting argument about the money and the work that we're putting into conserving our current species. Which is nowhere near enough. Yeah, um, exactly. And it, not, it shouldn't actually be a choice between the two. Hopefully we can do, do both. both. But, you know, we'll take a lot of investment, <laughs> a lot more than we're currently doing. I, we don't have a lot of time. I wonder if, is there any other questions online? Because I realise we've only got one. We, let's have another mm -hmm. online question. Uh, so this question comes from an anonymous question and answer. And they ask, if you had the power to remove a discovery from the past, what would you like to remove? It's a good question. So it's a it's a good question. Um, I um, don't think I would remove any. Actually, um, I think we learn as a species from our mistakes as well as our successes. Let's put it that way. And you can't undiscover something, actually, um, and you can't uninnovate something. Uh, so we do need to think about the ethics and the morals and the ways of. Uh, who gets to do that, how and in what framework, um, how are they motivated, what are they made it motivated by, for example. If you massively fund um, the defence industry and that's where all of your artificial intelligence drone development comes from, that may have a different outcome than if you were to put all of that funding into a more humanitarian use of the same technology. Uh, but you can't you know, once someone has discovered or, or innovated something, you can't take it away. But that's where uh, philosophy, ethics, morality, you know, uh, needs to intersect much more closely with, with science. Actually, our, our new head of the History and Philosophy of Science um, department here was just tweeting the other day that they, um, you know, think that every science sh student should have to do a, a subject in History and Philosophy of Science, and I could not agree more. Um, I'm very pleased that I, I did when I was a student here. I was very pleased that that was available to me as a science student. And if you're thinking of studying science or engineering, some of you I know are in the room, please study the history and philosophy of it as well. Um, it's so important to understanding the context of how different people think of different knowledges um, and the ways in which they're used in the world. Uh, and I think we need those informed citizens who can go forward and uh, do things in a, in a values-led way for our future. I know, actually, I was at a breakfast yesterday with mm. the Vice Chancellor and he said exactly the same thing. All students in science should be doing a history and philosophy of science subject. I will say that, that some of my physicist colleagues say that all his historians and philosophers of science should also be forced to study physics. <laughs> All right, we, we do have to end it there. I'll just um, close by just making a couple of announcements first before I thank Susie. Um, if, you, if you want more physics, um, we have an in-person physics show tomorrow and there's still a couple of tickets available. Uh, that's at 2.30 on the university campus. So go to science.unimelm.edu.au and you'll be able to book that. For those who want to join an event online, uh, two o'clock tomorrow, we've got a, uh, a discussion, a presentation about why grasshoppers have given up sex. Uh, so that's, <laughs> and you can book that as well via science.unimelm.edu.au. Can you give you'll us a spoiler? Sorry? Can you give us a spoiler? I'm not going to give you a spoiler, but it's basically females breeding without males. So, parthenogenesis. So, uh, and I'd like to just um, invite you to, for those in the room, to join us upstairs in the Western Gallery. We've got a few refreshments and you can continue the conversation. And I'd like to finish by thanking Susie. My father-in-law, in his book review, said clarity and enthusiasm. And that was certainly something that came across in your presentation as well. So thanks very much, Susie. It was a fantastic thank you. presentation. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. And there are books for sale and signings upstairs. Yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah. The book is for sale yeah. and Susie will sign them for you Do as well. You